morning and welcome to Right Scale Compute 2013. Please welcome to the stage Josh Frazier, Senior Vice President, Sales and Business Development at Right Scale. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Right Scale Compute. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate all you guys being here. So this is actually our seventh user conference, but it's got many firsts. You know, first off, this is the first time we've gone to a two-day format. Uh, it's also the first time we've branched away from Cloud Expo and are doing this entirely uh, on our own in conjunction with our partners. So we put together over the next two days over 35 different sessions that are specifically geared towards wherever you are on your adoption of cloud. You know, from assessment to optimizing what you're already doing and everything in between. So there really is something for everyone here. Uh, first off, before we go any further, I want to do a special thanks to our partners. For the first time, we have every major cloud provider present at one conference in one building. So you're going to hear from many of them throughout the session. The server templates available in our libraries and make right scale work. And finally, we have system integrators that we partner with. So together, this is the ecosystem around us that makes what right scale does possible. So thank you again to all of our partners. You're also going to hear from a variety of our customers. So telling you specific use cases on how they're using RightScale to achieve their specific goals. But really, at the end of the day, this conference is about you all, so our users. And we've dubbed this conference the most interesting conference in cloud, and we wanted to have a little fun with it. So what we're going to be doing throughout the show is we're going to be inviting all of you to please tweet your observations and experiences with RightScale specifically, or cloud in general. And we're going to be giving away a prize, uh, both at the end of this morning's session, uh, as well as this afternoon and then tomorrow as well, to the most interesting tweet. So those of you who may be familiar with the Spiros, all right, it's a great product if you have a, a cat you want to annoy or a small child or just about anything that you want to do that's uh, rolling around a ball automatically on the floor. We're going to be giving around a Spiro uh, later on this morning and then further prizes as the event continues. So we wanted to uh, kick things off this morning uh, and invite James Staten to address you all. James is the Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. And we found him to be one of the best informed uh, and leading thought leaders of how companies are adopting cloud. And Welcome, James Staten. If you want it like I want it, baby, let's get it tonight. Great, you thanks for having me. So glad that you all could come and join us here today. Um, I want to share with you some exclusive data. This is the first set of data that we've gotten back from our developer survey. So what I'm going to share with you today is going to give you a glimpse into um, the very latest information on who's actually using the cloud. And the reason I wanted to share, obviously, with this audience is because this is one of the more informed groups around cloud. It's not filled with people who are just coming to kick the tires. It's filled with people who are actually using this, who have access to clouds, who have been building things on them now, and see the value of partnering with a company like RightScale, who helps you take advantage of the capabilities of the various clouds that are out there, but do it in a way that gives you the freedom to do hybrid, switch clouds, do really complex implementations, and really scale things out, understanding that the cloud scales differently than the data center always has. And that puts us in a 30% of all the developers that are out there who actually have hands-on experience with the cloud. And that 30% we're the people who are really going to have to lead those that are the 70% who are not using the What our role is, what makes us unique here, is that if you take a look at cloud developers, you talk to them, you listen to what they care about, um, they're not the people who are sort of saying, is everybody else using cloud? Okay, good, it's safe. They're the ones who are sort of saying, I want to get something new done, something unique done. 
I don't care that other people aren't using this. If this is going to let me achieve that objective, I'm going. And so they don't actually look at the same peer group. They have a new peer group, and it's a peer group they get introduced to as they involve themselves in the cloud. As a result, they're building new types of applications and new functionalities. If we look at the preponderance of mobile applications that are out there, the majority of the mobile applications that are out there are built by people who have cloud knowledge and are deploying those applications with the back end sitting on a cloud. They're also risk takers. They're willing to tap into a service that they don't know if the performance is going to be where they need it to be. They don't know if the availability is going to be there. Um, and as a result, all of us in the cloud world, we get these little learning moments whenever the cloud fails. Um, so the other thing that's also different about us is we actually look at these failures and we look at them from a different lens. We look at a failure of the cloud and say, that's a learning opportunity. That's a chance for me to figure out how I might configure things differently so that I can actually survive that outage. Whereas the 70% look at that and say, oh, see, it's not mature enough. It's not ready for us. We don't need to go there. As a result, we are also troublemakers because we look at that 70% and say, you don't get it. You really have to understand that we have to design things differently. You really have to understand that this is the future. Um, I am going to do stuff here in the cloud whether you want me to or not. And by the way, I'm also going to probably have my own little side project where I do the cloud for me as well. By understanding who we are helps us understand how different we are from the rest of the market. The interesting thing about it, if you're not in a small startup company, if you're part of a large enterprise or you're part of a larger ecosystem of developers, this means you actually have a responsibility as well. So let's look a little bit deeper into this. Who are the cloud developers and how different are they? Well, we take a look at who the cloud developers are. Less than a fourth of us work for a large enterprise. So we tend to be in smaller organizations which embrace a little bit more of the innovation, a little more of the troublemaking. It's kind of OK for that to be the case. We find that, as a result, these are all oftentimes smaller firms. So if you look at the preponderance of the dark blue, people that are not using the cloud, you see that there's more of those people, and there's a higher contrast in the larger organizations that you get to. We find that only a quarter of cloud developers actually are in the United States, which means there's a high number of people in Asia that are tapping into the cloud and using these cloud services, high number in Europe as well. We find the majority are not the majority, but close to the majority, are under 35. So we've got a younger group that's really paying attention to this. We also find that the experience level is actually relatively high. So it's not these whippersnapper programmers right out of college necessarily, but more experienced developers who have two to three years of experience, six to 10 years of experience, who are really tapping into the cloud. We also find that most of the people doing cloud are, as you would expect, using the more modern architectures, but we're not doing just the cutting edge. We are using some of the more traditional, more mature architectures, runtimes for our designs as well. When we talk about languages, the prevailing view is that the people that are designing in the cloud are doing JavaScript, PHP, and Ruby, and nothing else. And that's not true. We're finding that a significant amount of cloud developers are still using Java are still using .NET. In fact, we see a significant amount that are still using C++. So it goes again to that maturity. This is a class of developer. We are a class of developer who has the traditional skills, has the understanding of the traditional side of things. But we're willing to go a little further. We also find that, as I mentioned before, most people who are developing in the cloud are turning the cloud into their resume. They have a side project. They have a sub-account or a separate account that they build their own side projects around. Now, that might lead you to be believe that all cloud developers are building a mobile app on the side, and when that thing has a, a million downloads, they're going to leave your company and go do that. Um, some of that's true. A lot of that isn't true. A lot of that is, I really am wanting to experiment, and maybe I'm going to experiment in my personal account a bit further than I would for my company's account. We also find that cloud developers have a better relationship with the business than the typical traditional developer. And this is a really important difference. It's not a huge difference. So if you look at the chart and you see the dark gray, that gives you the contrast between these two groups. If we look at a lot of developers who are not using cloud, 
there's a lot more of the blue that you see there where I don't have a good relationship or the relationship is just neutral. Um, what makes cloud developers different here and why they have a better relationship with the business is because usually when we are innovating, we're doing it so the business can get a new service done, where they can get a new capability out in the door. And we bring a different attitude to this as well. Cloud developers bring an attitude of, yes, it can be done. The impossible is not impossible. Whereas a traditional developer has a tendency to say, I've got a whole lot of legacy code, I've got a whole lot of spaghetti code, I don't know if I could do anything new with it. And if I try to add anything new to it, I could break what's already there. And so you get this more conservative nature that really points to the psychographic difference between those of us that really do cloud and those that are not doing it. It also comes through in regular enjoyment of the job. Those who are innovating, those who are creating, those who are, are pushing the limits tend to like their job more. They tend not to be the one who has to make sure that the PeopleSoft system that was deployed in 1985 um, still runs. And that we had to add columns to the Oracle database that was set up in 2001. That tends to be what happens with a lot of developers who aren't using cloud. And that's why they're worried about the code changes and why they're worried about embracing new things because there's an impact on the code that they're responsible for maintaining and sustaining. And it's the difference between these two groups that really is what we need to focus on. Because one of the key things that's important to understand is that those of you here who are doing cloud, you have a responsibility. While you are rebels, while you are driving things for the business, while you are making new things possible, while you are creating the future, we cannot leave the 70% behind. We have to show the 70% how to use the cloud. We need to bring them forward. Because I can guarantee you one thing that you are doing to them right now, when you build something in the cloud, it's pretty unlikely that what you built in the cloud is operating 100% in isolation. You were probably tying that cloud capability back to something sitting in the data center. And they're scared to death that what you're bringing over is going to bring them down. And so it's really critical that we embrace hybrid. But not hybrid in the sense that I, as a cloud developer, need to know what hybrid means and what the implications are. I need to understand what it means to the developers I'm impacting. And so we have to play a critical role here where we need to become evangelists for the cloud. We need to start spreading the word, spreading the best practices, spreading how we understand maturity, spreading what we've learned that makes the cloud less scary, that makes the cloud more mature in their eyes, more safe in their eyes than it probably is today. We have to become teachers. We have to take people who aren't using the cloud and tell them how to use it and show them how to connect their code to our code and then to create the new code on their own. All of us have this responsibility within our own organizations as well as in the greater ecosystem. We have to be team players. When they bring a concern to the table, like I heard the other day from one of our clients, We've got five mobile applications that are talking to mobile backends. They're all hitting the Oracle database, and the Oracle database is going down, so I'm shutting off their connections. Ooh, that's a problem. Now, us and the, they're building those cloud applications, they're like, nope, sorry, we're way too important. We've got 10 million downloads. There's no way you can shut these connections off. That's not a team approach. That's an us versus them approach. A team approach is, I hear you. What do we need to do together to make this work? So we have to take this kind of an attitude and this kind of approach. And lastly, we need to be advocates. We need to make sure that they know what clouds we're using, what tools we're using, what approaches we're taking, how this is going to be part of the architecture going forward, and how they can incorporate this in their own thinking. So, if, so that's what I want to leave all of you with here today. You're going to learn an awful lot about the cloud. You are all going to learn about each other. You're all going to think there's this, the cloud people up here and everybody else down here. If that is the case in five to 10 years, we are going to have a whole bunch of people behind who never get there. So take the responsibility yourself here and get to know this, the other 70%. Know that you are a leader. You are someone they respect. And turn that into an opportunity to teach evangelize, and bring them into the fold. So that when we have this conference next year, there's twice as many people here because half the 70% came because you've invited them to. Hope that gives you a way to kick this day off. And now I'm going to bring Josh back on stage. Thanks so much. Yeah.
Thanks, James. Thank you. Back. I appreciate that insight, James. Yeah, we, who knew we were all these bridge builders out there, huh? So those of you who want to hear more from James, he has a session at 11.30 uh, this morning, and he'll be at the conference for most of the day, so please stop by. There's also uh, a great report that James uh, co-authored out of Forrester called The Rise of the Cloud Admin. And I encourage you all that don't subscribe to check it out and, and do subscribe with Forrester. It does give the best perspectives and insights that we've seen to date, specifically on private clouds and what that's doing to large organizations in terms of a transformation within central IT. So really interesting read. encourage you guys to check it out. So up next, I want to introduce our CEO uh, and founder, Michael Crandell. Uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of working for Michael for five years now, and a lot of us know Michael for his thought leadership in cloud, and you know, I think uh, I'm I one and very appreciative of that. But in sticking with the theme of the most interesting conference in cloud, I wanted to share a little anecdote about Michael that most of you probably don't know, which is many, many years ago, I won't tell you how old he is, uh, many, many years ago, Michael was on a very different path. Uh, he was actually in divinity school at Harvard University. Uh, so it didn't last long. <laughs> His uh, natural uh, affinity towards technology kind of bit him, and then he moved on. But you know, I think I can speak for the industry at large and everyone here that, Michael, thank you for taking a different course, because we're glad you are where you are. And with that, a warm welcome uh, to Michael Crandell, our CEO and founder. All you party people bring it when the time is decreed. You feel the need of a one step, two step, TCP like Bubba. Thank you, Josh. Um, well, the secret's out. I'm a Divinity School dropout. Uh, huge welcome to all of you here today uh, joining us as part of the RightScale community. Um, as others have said, what this whole conference is about is to try and spark your thinking, to start a discussion, uh, and we look forward, everybody from RightScale who's here, as well as partners and so on, and engaging with you in that discussion and learning about your thoughts, uh, and hopefully you can teach us something too during the next two days. I'd like to share with you some thoughts that we have at RightScale about the state of the cloud. Uh, and we address this at the beginning of the conference rather than diving into product details, which we'll, we'll have more material, material on throughout the day as well as tomorrow morning of the direction of the product and so on, uh, because we think we sit in a special perch at RightScale. We got involved in this new disruptive technology trend uh, very close to the beginning and in partnership with some of the innovative customers that we've had over the years, we have special visibility into what customers are doing, et cetera. And so I'd like to share some observations that come out of that experience. Uh, the state of the cloud is change. And that may seem kind of obvious and self-evident that the norm is change. It actually has been pretty much since the beginning of this movement. Uh, but it has important implications for how we think you should think about what you're doing in terms of cloud adoption. And in particular, this image here of the trains, uh, the train station with people coming and going, hopping on, hopping off, is, is very apt, I think, because Cloud adoption is a journey. And probably each of us in this room and each of your companies are at different stages along that journey. Uh, and, and so your attitude toward that is key. You'll be making choices about tools, about platforms, about partners that you work with. But most of all, you'll be making choices about the approach that you take in cloud adoption along the way. And I'd like to call out five themes uh, from the last year that we've been focused on, that we've seen kind of rise to the fore, and they are about choice, about outages, hopefully how to avoid them, about the DevOp movements, uh, which, which James just spoke about, uh, an unexpected consequence of the on-demand nature of cloud, and then a little bit about how we view what it's like to be a mature organization in terms of cloud adoption. So let's dive right in. Uh, it's been a remarkable year in terms of new players in this market. Um, and we call it the rise of the clouds. Uh, you know, it's almost mandatory for uh, any writer, any article, journalist, blogger who talks about this market to point out, rightly so, that Amazon Web Services is the leader. 
And of course, you can see from the image, one building is standing out higher than the others. But we also believe that it's early days in this market and that we can already see the beginnings that there are multiple players here and there'll be a lot of choice. Um, one analogy that I think of is around the advent of smartphones. If we all remember, harken back to the days when Apple first introduced the iPhone, how amazing, how remarkable, how innovative that was, how it captured our imagination. And for the first several years, if you recall, it was hard to imagine anyone else catching up, anyone else participating in that market meaningfully. Fast forward to now, 2013, uh, it's a vibrant ecosystem of players, right? There are Android phones out there too. There's a lot of choice, which at the end of the day benefits all consumers uh, in that market. And we think something similar uh, will end up happening. Of course, you know, the future is yet to happen, but that's, that's what we see. But let's look back at what we've seen over the last year. It's been a remarkable year uh, of various players getting into this market of infrastructure as a service. We had HP launch, we had Google and Azure launch in private beta last June. Rackspace uh, pretty much redid their concept of a public cloud around the OpenStack platform. Um, Amazon, of course, introduced lots of new web services and expanded further globally. Um, so massive growth there. We just recently, in the last month or so, had VMware announce their public cloud would, that they would enter that market with the, I think it's called the VMware Hybrid Cloud Services division. Um, and again, in the last month, we had Windows Azure go general availability and announce that they were going to match all of the prices of AWS. We also saw a lot of innovation on the open source uh, private cloud side, CloudStack joined the Apache Foundation and reissued their software under that license. Uh, and OpenStack, of course, huge momentum with their summit recently um, and announcing Grizzly. So we've seen an amazing year of developments here and a vibrant set of choices that are available. And in addition to that, we've seen a, a continuing kind of drumbeat and trend toward hybrid cloud, toward uh, being able to take advantage of all of those options along with building your own private cloud infrastructure and sharing it. Um, as this, uh, we love this image of uh, combining solar and wind energy as kind of an image of that. I wanted to share some statistics throughout my talk from a survey that we've just recently completed and have uh, announced today in a press release some of those results. Here's one of them. We did this survey and had over 600 responses from the general RightScale community. That includes not just customers, but users of the free edition uh, and those who have just given us their email address in one form or another, attending webinars, downloading white papers, uh, just visiting the website. So that's the population we have. We think it's probably an audience that's got a little more affinity for cloud uh, than perhaps the general audience, so it might be a little more advanced. But these are statistics from that survey. What we found is that 77% of the respondents said that multi-cloud is part of their strategy. And that dark blue portion, that's up from 68% last year when we did the survey previously. And, you know, actually it reminds me, I looked at it one day, I've been looking at this chart, and it reminded me kind of a Pac-Man creature, if you remember Pac-Man, kind of slowly eating up those who don't want to support multiple clouds in their strategy. And if we break out from there, we see that 47%, not just of the multi-cloud, but 47% overall, so nearly half are planning some kind of hybrid cloud strategy. We've also seen a lot of evolution on that front. So uh, what we have uh, helped partner with companies like Coupa and Quest Diagnostics in the past to build is a concept around hybrid cloud that really emphasizes a portfolio of resource pools. The notion there is that you run certain apps in one environment and you run other apps in the other environment. 
And so they're both available to you. You can launch in either one. But the apps and the app clusters tend to exist in one or the other. And what we've seen just recently in this evolution of hybrid cloud is the notion of actually combining public and private clouds into a unified resource pool, where an application can be a spread across those, almost as if they're different failure isolation zones. And I don't want to steal too much thunder from Richard Kaufman's talk, he's coming after me, but he's going to go into more detail about what they've done at Samsung innovating on, on this principle, and it's a very exciting development I think you'll all be interested in. So the next trend after choice is really around outages. And I picked that word in particular because I think outages are fascinating. They do fascinate us. We're all rubberneckers when it comes to outages and reading about them, especially if they don't affect our apps or services. <laughs> it's a lot more fun to read about them then. This is an image of Manhattan during Hurricane Sandy. And you can see, except for that one little chunk in the lower left, lower Manhattan has gone dark. So this is the outage that occurred then. And uh, we decided to do a deep dive because in some senses we feel like this, this subject of outages is kind of like Groundhog Day. It keeps repeating over and over, and the story kind of goes like this. Acme Cloud Services had an outage yesterday at 4.11 p.m. It affected hundreds or thousands of their customers, and in particular, companies X, Y, and Z uh, had their services go down. And this raises the question, is public cloud really reliable? And, you know, having been in this business for six years, we've kind of seen this story repeat over and over and over, and decided to do some analysis and research uh, to dive deeper than this repeating kind of Groundhog Day story. So we looked at all the publicly reported outages, there were about 27, in 2012, and tried to analyze the characteristics there. And this is what we found. The first thing that we found uh, were this spread, uh, that public cloud tends to take a bashing here, but unfairly so. Um, I think in these stats, to give my own opinion on them, I think probably the private data center stats are underrepresented. And the reason for that is that private data centers don't publicly report outages all the time. It's pretty obvious. And the hosting provider is probably overrepresented because this time period did include Hurricane Sandy, which hit Manhattan, which has a lot of hosting and managed hosting providers there. But that said, you know, we believe that public cloud actually statistically is probably more reliable, more resilient to outages than running your own data center. Second thing we found is there are a whole variety of reasons why these outages occur. Uh, of course, there's power failures. Data centers usually try to prepare for that, but then sometimes there are problems with the, the backup generators. So the outage is a result of a dual failure. Um, DNS routing, traffic issues, software bugs. Uh, as much as we try to design for resiliency, sometimes there are bugs in the control planes uh, that affect more than one failure isolation zone. And as a result of that, it kind of defeats the purpose of the failure isolation zones and outages are the result. And of course, human error, someone misconfigures a router or performs an update that just didn't work right. So, unfortunately, these do cause damage, right, in the form of downtime. And we analyzed of these 27 largest outages, average seven and a half hours of downtime. Uh, of course, it can go much longer than that. And uh, the good news, however, behind all this is that you can avoid the impact of outages. We don't believe that they will ever go away. We don't think you can avoid having outages. It's a bad strategy. You shouldn't count on your provider uh, promising you that there won't be outages. You shouldn't count on an SLA that seems to represent in contractual terms that you won't have an outage. What you should do is design around it. And we have a, a kind of a distilled quote from one of our customers, 500 friends, around what we think our, our customers have been able to achieve. It's a focus of right scale 
to help our customers, those who want to pursue best practices, design systems that span multiple resource pools so that they can avoid the impact of outages. And our customers really have fared quite a bit better either avoiding the impact altogether or, or severely limiting the impact of outages. The next theme is one of my favorites and harks back to what James talked about, the DevOps movement. We think in the last year, this is of course not a brand new movement, it's been going for years, but it's really rising to the fore. Uh, we had a customer dinner last night and I heard from I think everybody at, at the table I was at as a customer said they're practicing uh, DevOps. But just to clarify what we mean by that, uh, and I think it's a general principle, you know, it stems from the fact that historically, and I go back to these times in organizations when development and operations were pretty much separate departments, separate teams. And, you know, the, the, the simple concept was that the developers built it and the ops team broke it, right? or depending on which side of the fence you're on, vice versa, ops got it running well and then developers changed something and it was broken again. And I love the looks in their eyes there. You know, obviously this caused a little tension, a little friction or distance, you might say, uh, between the two parts of the organization responsible for delivering software. DevOps really fixes all that. And DevOps is not about one or the other practice taking dominance. It's about collaboration. It's about communication and integration between the two teams with a simple purpose, which is to release software faster and with fewer failures. Um, there's a statistic from Puppet Labs that says companies that pursue DevOps develop software 30 times faster and with 50% fewer failures. So it's, it's also something that gets practice through the organization, right? DevOps is about how the organization has teams relating, and it's also about things like version control and automation that allow predictability in how you're deploying software. By today, DevOps is pretty much linked at the hip with cloud computing because the rapid provisioning of cloud computing really enables the full promise of DevOps, which is all around, of course, agility and, and quick delivery of software. So we find, and I think in your organizations, you should look to this combination as, as really the vehicle to deliver the next generation of applications. Again, going back to our survey, we saw among our population that DevOps has really hit a tipping point because 55% of the folks that we surveyed are using DevOps either in teams or business units or throughout their company. And one thing that we believe is critical to this is how you develop a framework of trust between all the constituencies that are involved in delivering software from its development through production and that there should be a framework for that. It's not just that people decide to be friends, it's the processes and tools they use to work together. And we think actually key to delivering this is having some kind of management, right? And here are the basic principles of why management helps deliver DevOps. The first is templatizing workloads. When you templatize workloads, you get predictability of how they run. So throughout the life cycle, you know that when a workload, when a server is launched or a group of servers, you know exactly how they're going to behave. And you can impose versioning on those, et cetera. So there's no longer any question or unpredictability uh, all the way through the life cycle. Automation is another key. Because with automation, you not only get quicker response, automated responses to different situations, ranging from traffic spikes and dips to failure situations, uh, but you get, again, more kind of pre predictability into the process. Having a dashboard that allows all of those teams from the beginning of R&D through testing through production to view that process and how it's running, uh, a unified dashboard is another key. And then finally, having an open platform where as your software goes through the life cycle, 
you have freedom of choice as to where you run things and how you run them. Those are all critical points in, again, delivering the promise of DevOps. I wanted to also chat about on-demand, and for those of you who are wondering, this is an image that does a physical mapping of Wi-Fi signals as you walk through a neighborhood. <clears throat> it might as well be a graph of uh, resource utilization in cloud computing, servers and storage and so on. Uh, and it shows, of course, the variability in usage. If you go back to the very dawn of time in infrastructure as a service, there, there were two characteristics that made it disruptive and new and so revolutionary, in my view. The first was around the technology side of things. Cloud computing employed an API to allocate and launch resources, servers, storage, networking, etc. So that was the first characteristic. But perhaps more compelling was aspect of the business model that said you could do this on demand, pay for what you used, and stop paying when you stop using those resources. And that created the very variability that powered cloud computing, that captured imaginations, that drove reduction in cost, etc. But it's come to have another side uh, as we fast forward to today. So let's look back historically, right, to the olden days at the very beginning, and we were there at right scale. Here was the pricing. Again, AWS was the pioneer, and there were three prices that you had to worry about. There was one size of server. It cost 10 cents an hour, period. You could get storage on S3 for 15 cents per gigabyte per month, and you paid 20 cents per gigabyte up and down traffic-wise. This was circa 2007, I think, and this is an actual screen grab. I think we pulled it off the Wayback Machine. Fast forward to today. It's a different picture, isn't it? Now, today in 2013, we have a division of RightScale called Plan for Cloud that helps companies do cost forecasting and planning and different scenarios. And it maps across multiple clouds. You can run scenarios and, and check out pricing across several different cloud providers, public cloud providers. You can run different scenarios on how you purchase, because there are many options for purchasing now. You can purchase on demand or reserved instances or spot instances, depending on the provider. Uh, and then run different scenarios of how things scale up and down. Plan for Cloud in its database currently tracks more than 12,000 discrete prices across all of the cloud providers that we support, which isn't even all of them in the world. 12,000. So we've gone from three to 12,000 prices. It means there's a lot of flexibility in the ability to tune what you're doing, to optimize what you're doing, to compare prices, and to be more efficient. But it's at the cost of massive complexity now. It's massively complex to do this. So much so that spending on cloud computing has kind of come full circle from, de excuse me, from developers allocating resources on a credit card and getting their job done or, or business units independently using cloud. We all know that story. It's come back around to the C-suite. <clears throat> and it's now a concern of the CFO. How can we make sure that we're maximizing this spend? <coughs> and how do we track it? How do we measure it over time? And how can we plan effectively to make sure that we're really getting the most out of this new way of delivering IT? So much so that I would suggest that competency in your organization around cost management and forecasting and reporting around cost has become as critical and key a competency as automation, configuration management, and the more technical aspects of cloud. Cost forecasting is as critical to the proper utilization of cloud adoption as the technical automation that it provides. And that's something that we focus on. This is a screenshot of, of Plan for Cloud here, which shows you know, one particular scenario that someone mapped. And I'd encourage you to all go check it out. 
Uh, it's free, so you can, you can try it for free, import what you're doing, and take a look. So ultimately, after we look at those four trends, I wanted to share a little bit about um, what cloud maturity looks like in our view. And as a result of this survey, we came up with a conclusion. The punchline is this. We call it the cloud value imperative. And it's, it's as follows. The more an organization increases its cloud usage, the more benefits it reaps, and the fewer challenges it faces. So the more you use cloud, the better it gets. That's the simple punchline. And one of the ways that we discovered this was by taking a look at the scale and the stage of adoption of the respondents. So uh, we looked, and we didn't give it these names so that it didn't skew results. We didn't say, are you a watcher or a beginner, and so on. But what we did say is identify the stage of adoption that you have. Are you still planning? Are you in the analysis, planning, and strategy stage? Do you have a POC or a first project running? Third, Cloud Explorers, do you have one or more applications in production? And then finally, uh, are you, is Cloud your primary infrastructure in your organization? So this is how we divided out what we call the Cloud Maturity Model. And, you know, harking back to something that, uh, again, that James Staten wrote, I think it was maybe a year and a half or two and a half years ago, you'll have to correct me if I get it wrong, uh, he wrote about what stage are we at in the evolution of cloud computing in general. And I think if I recall correctly, you said we're kind of at an adolescent stage. And so there, you can see there's a lot of promise, um, there's activity, there's energy, but some awkwardness in how this technology is being deployed and adopted. So I wouldn't disagree with that. I do think that we're still in early days. But I think we can now have some vision of what it looks like when you grow up in terms of cloud adoption. What it looks like for organizations who are far down this path toward being a cloud-focused adopter. And there are two major characteristics, and here are some of the stats. So across this set of benefits, you can see that among the different populations, just across the board, the benefits increase. Whether it's quick access to infrastructure and scalability, HA kinds of benefits, geographic reach, uh, business continuity, higher performance. Across the board, the more that companies adopted cloud, the more they reaped the benefits. And even more interesting to us, we also asked about challenges. And these are, of course, perceived challenges because they're self-reported. But as you can see here, same trend of challenges decreasing. There's a little more interest here in terms of which challenges decrease more than others. So I found it interesting, for example, that compliance challenges decreased from beginners to explorers and then kind of leveled out. My theory about that is that compliance often involves processes outside the technology um, that don't necessarily decrease that much as you use more of the technology. But look at what happens to the first one around security. As we all know, security has been the number one concern about cloud computing since the very beginning of its introduction, uh, and I think continues to be probably the number one cited concern or blocker or challenge that companies face. But as we go across those stages, it goes down from 38% as cloud beginners naming it as a challenge down to 18. It's a reduction in half. So you're getting more benefits and facing fewer challenges as you adopt more cloud. And I think all of this wraps up into a conclusion that says cloud-focused fo organizations actually, to go back to the themes that I highlighted, are the organizations that are taking advantage of choice, of multi-cloud capabilities, and impl implementing that strategy. They're the organizations that are good at minimizing the impact of outages. They're designing for failure. They're building resilience into their software architecture and not depending on the low-level infrastructure to stay up all the time. They're the ones who are far and away are the leaders in the DevOps movement. 
as, as I said before, DevOps is joined at the hips with implementing cloud, and these organizations are certainly at the forefront. And then finally, there are also organizations that we see um, who have adopted methodologies and tools for managing costs, tracking costs, being able to do chargeback and showback to see where the infrastructure spend is going, and optimizing around the variability that is such a boon of cloud, but has also become a challenge in terms of management. So ultimately, as all of us are on this journey, somewhere on the journey to cloud, whether you're an explorer, a beginner, uh, et cetera, all the way through to a cloud-focused organization, you're somewhere along the way. And we know that you can certainly take an approach of do it yourself, where if you have the people, the competencies, the technology, and the patience to invest in that, you will make your own way along that journey. But we believe that lots of companies will want to have a partner along the way who's been there and done that, who really offers trusted expertise in how to design applications, implement them, and manage them after the fact to deliver the true promise of cloud computing. And that's really been RightScale's goal since the very beginning. Our mission has been that we believe that cloud computing represents a better way to deliver the value of IT to the business, and we're here to help you get there. So I really appreciate your being here. I look forward to continuing the conversation throughout today and tomorrow, um, and thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. It's worth pointing out that I think the success rate of cloud in general is slightly higher than summiting Everest, so it's good for everyone in this room. Uh, so we've had a chance to hear about perspectives on the industry with, from both Michael and James, and thank you again, Michael and James. We appreciate everything you had to say. I want to pivot slightly now and introduce Richard Kaufman from Samson SDS. And all of us know Samson, but not as many of us probably are familiar with Samson SDS. Uh, Samson SDS is actually the third largest IT services provider in all of Asia Pacific, 14,000 plus employees, worldwide uh, customer base. And we invited Richard today to speak about an incredibly innovative approach towards what they're doing with hybrid cloud. Uh, Richard, prior to Samsung SDS, spent 10 years uh, at Hewlett Packard, where he was the chief technologist, and was one of the key enablers and thought leaders behind uh, HP's cloud services. So, Richard Kaufman, Samsung SDS. Thanks for taking 10 years off my life. Um, I was at HP for 20 years. Uh, let's see. So, um, as Josh said, Samsung is a huge company. Samsung SDS is a member of the Samsung group. And, you know, Samsung makes dishwashers and TVs and cell phones and everything on the planet. Uh, we are an IT services provider that sells uh, predominantly within the Samsung group, but also outside the Samsung group, were roughly $6 billion, um, which actually is a fairly rare beast in an IT service provider. That's, that's fairly big. Uh, so um, I'm here to talk about um, our personal cloud service. And remember, we sell this service to others. Most of the others are other companies in the Samsung group, I can't talk about their business, I can talk about what we do. So that, that shapes some of, of what I say today. Um, so we have data centers worldwide. Uh, we have our personal cloud service stood up in Korea and in Virginia at the moment uh, with plans to grow to Europe. And uh, the reason I'm here today is that we've adopted an architecture which allows us to use a public cloud provider as well as our private cloud, and we've selected RightScale as a way that we orchestrate and manage uh, workloads between the two. So, um, and the, the other important thing is that our private cloud technology is built on OpenStack, and we deploy uh, Nova for compute, Swift for object store, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we also run a very large traditional hosting business 
and we're busy plumbing the connections between our cloud service and our bare metal service. So uh, the other thing is uh, we, we, we sort of think of ourselves as having a very small number of customers. They just all happen to be Godzillas, right? So they're deploying very large properties that would have 100 million endpoints or more. And you can imagine you, you might have an endpoint in your pocket. Uh, you might wash your clothes in an endpoint. And the, um, uh, so our Godzilla customers um, really expect us to deploy um, infrastructure that they can um, stand up worldwide. We want to ensure that they don't get locked into any one particular technology, uh, that the service, uh, especially the network, is designed to handle this large number of endpoints, um, and that we have but, but a lot of the things that a normal public cloud provider has to deal with, you know, tens of thousands of customers, uh, we're not as concerned with. So uh, if we look at what our customers insist upon, it's um, uh, high performance. We tend to over-provision our networks compared to uh, most public cloud providers. Uh, my servers right now have multiple 10 gigabit links coming out of them. And that's, that's unusual in this space. Um, uh, probably not unlike a lot of the people in the room, we have um, insanely strict security requirements. And it's not paranoia in our, our case. They really are out to get us. And we, um, <laughs> and so uh, we have to keep the crown jewels very much under lock and key. When I go into a third party data center, um, we don't, we're not okay with just chain link fences uh, separating our gear from, from the other folks. Uh, we actually have cameras and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Uh, so, uh, but we also want to, to manage our costs. It's not the number one concern for the private cloud side. Uh, we can do the uh, low cost stuff in a public cloud environment, but we try and engineer so that uh, as we scale, um, our costs will, will be uh, manageable and hopefully low. And uh, a general rule of thumb is if you can guarantee 80% uh, or more utilization of hardware, you could uh, conceivably uh, have your costs compared to running in a public cloud. Um, but that preamble is something that most people don't meet, which is achieving 80% or more utilization. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we um, have to earn our customers' business, which means that we're not plumbing for uh, the, the maximum scale at the beginning. So the use of a public cloud allows us to uh, peak uh, early um, uh, without the, the huge upfront uh, capex. So um, if you look at the directions we have, first we, we chose OpenStack. Uh, for our private cloud implementation, uh, we chose uh, RightScale as an as a orchestration partner. Uh, that helps avoid uh, lock-in between a, a public or private um, API set. And uh, we also uh, are going for common operations between our traditional hosting business and our cloud business. So if you look at what we offer, uh, currently, we uh, use Nova, which is the OpenStack compute service uh, for compute, uh, Cinder for volume, uh, Nova network. Uh, we're going to quantum eventually. Uh, if those of you not in the OpenStack tribe, don't worry about all these buzzwords. And uh, uh, an object storage service uh, called Swift, um, Glance for image management, Keystone for identity management, but remember we're only managing a few identities for um, our Godzilla customers. The, uh, now, we don't want uh, our customers to get locked into OpenStack either, so uh, for the most part, uh, we like to abstract away the APIs, and so uh, a lot of uh, the OpenStack services are available with an S3 or EC2 compatibility layer. That's helpful, but uh, RightScale helps, helps abstract a lot of that away uh, altogether. Uh, we've made some improvements uh, to OpenStack 
and that immediately people could go, what the heck did you do that for? Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, mostly we, we have regrets uh, uh, caused by us starting early, um, and we're, we're trying to get rid of as much customization as we can. You can see our path. Uh, we started uh, actually, uh, you know, in 2011, and uh, Diablo, Essex, Folsom, uh, OpenStack releases are increment on their first letter, and they happen every six months. So that gives you an idea of, of how we're trying to uh, stay uh, current. Uh, the, uh, if you're on trunk right now, you're actually beyond Grizzly. You're on the early drops of Havana. And uh, we're not there yet, but hope to be. So if you look at what we put on top of a bare IAS layer like OpenStack, uh, we have a custom portal. Uh, you have to build your own um, back office support systems for metering and billing. Uh, we use uh, Chef to deploy our own infrastructure. Uh, Nagios with a bunch of custom plugins to do monitoring. Uh, we use a, a hardware load balancer and uh, Samsung's security policy. Remember, they are out to get us, um, so we have uh, uh, significant investments in DDoS and IPS gear and firewalls uh, fronting all, all of our services. Uh, now, a lot of the things, even in these add-on stacks, there are uh, now open source projects uh, that are uh, trying to supplant some of these either custom efforts or commercial things that we buy. Uh, we're tracking that, very interested in that. But that's somewhat under the covers. And then uh, in the future, um, uh, and the OpenStack Nova effort is, is doing work here, we'd like to make it so that you can deploy bare metal servers with the same ease that you deploy a virtual machine. Um, I'm old enough to know that it's just a continuous circle. Uh, the computer science majors virtualize things, and the hardware weenies turn around and make them physical again. So we're busy trying to, to now figure out how to deploy bare metal servers as part of our system. Um, that's partly uh, to be able to manage old gunky servers that are, that are lying around uh, for traditional um, applications, but also for things like big data. Um, Hadoop clusters, those guys generally don't like virtualization, although uh, maybe they'll just get over it. Uh, the second thing uh, that we're looking at is deploying a software-defined network. Uh, that's very important for provisioning bare metal. Uh, in a IAS system, you actually rely on the fact that there's a virtual switch inside the server to enforce network security. And uh, when you have bare metal servers, you no longer have that virtual switch. Well, um, it, when you deploy an SDN, especially one that uh, allows you to use OpenFlow, you can essentially implement the security in the, in, inside the network switch, the physical network switch, the, the same, uh, and you can treat that physical network switch like a virtual switch. Remember how I said that the hardware folks basically take all this virtualized, virtualization stuff and get rid of it? Well, now you have a hardware implementation of a virtual switch. Uh, and then uh, finally, we're uh, uh, as part of what we're doing for hybrid clouds, uh, self-provision uh, virtual private clouds. OK, so now on to the meat, uh, which is uh, we want to very efficiently deploy services that bridge across our private cloud, where we have our crown jewels and where we have um, the base of our compute needs. Uh, and we want to distribute that over to a public cloud as well. Uh, what we're talking about here is using WriteScale as the software layer that controls between the two. And the um, part of it is, uh, at the beginning, if you look at the, the, the path Samsung has taken, is that before we started, we just used a public cloud. Uh, stage two, which is uh, where we're just coming to, is that we have uh, a single availability zone in Korea, one in Virginia, uh, that, uh, and then a public cloud uh, someplace close by that where we can distribute applications across. Now, we actually have a data center in China that has a service running on it now on top of OpenStack. Uh, so I guess we, 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 we can declare we're at stage two now 
although I'm all focused on getting that deployed worldwide. And then as um, our usage grows, we will uh, have multiple availability zones in a single region of the private cloud and then use pub the public cloud for bursting and for uh, co-location with uh, partners. So uh, now, in order to be able to do that, first you have to have um, a, a hybrid management uh, software stack, Brightscale in this case, to, to help manage the API insanity. But you also need to make sure that your developers don't fall into a trap of relying on something that a public cloud provider uh, has that's different, or even OpenStack has that's different from what other folks have. So um, uh, partly you can do that by just always deploying part of that application in the place that implements that API. Mostly, you just want people to program their way around that stuff and, and pave over it and not rely on it. OK. Uh, now, um, Michael always refers to you know, uh, buying the base and renting the peak. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, but again, that helps minimize your capex. We're kind of big. And so we mostly think of it as a way of ensuring that uh, we have the flexibility to grow where we need. Uh, we, we, we know how to build a spreadsheet to figure out where things are cheaper. But again, it's um, avoiding a success disaster, being able to scale the services when we want, where we want, that's more important. So if you look at um, uh, kind of the options we had as we were building this, uh, we wanted to be very close to a public cloud for network proximities. Well, gee, if you go in Virginia, um, I can throw a rock and hit two outposts for public cloud services in the same room in my data center. And uh, because we're in the Ashburn uh, Reston area, uh, you can get very cheap bandwidth to any other data center there and ground zero, which is uh, where, the, uh, for example, the Amazon Direct Connect is located, but uh, all sorts of other uh, network um, uh, drops are located. Uh, I, I grew up um, uh, in the business in a way where I have nightmares about correlated failure. Michael uh, touched on this. That's the idea that some something that you don't think should be correlated is and causes your whole service to go down. So when uh, uh, we look at data centers and we look at, and I look at any service, you know, I kind of march around the building. I want to make sure that I have two independent ISPs. Each one uses two different pipes going two different directions out of the building and that there's no commonality uh, at all. So, uh, for example, when, when getting a direct connect to a public cloud provider, um, some of these folks offer uh, diverse services. I, I turn those down, and instead I get single, uh, single points of failure with each ISP, but I have two ISPs. So, you know, somebody fat fingering my, my network link can't take down two links, they can just take down one link. That's, that's very important. So uh, we have dedicated links into the public cloud provider or providers that we are using. Uh, we, as I said, we selected RightScale as our hybrid controller. Um, and then we have certain usage models or templates that we use uh, for um, our customers to deploy their applications. So uh, everybody has to have an ugly looking network diagram. Here's mine. And uh, on the left, you see my uh, private cloud, and uh, the reason that box is big up in the top is that it's really expensive to deploy um, DDoS and IPS gear, um, but we have it. And so the um, dual uh, ISPs, again, with no correlated failure possibilities, go into uh, my uh, redundant network front end gear, and then uh, goes uh, to my virtual machines then I've got dual um, ISP connected direct connects to a public cloud provider, uh, and then uh, software that allows that to get connected. 
So here's what an application looks like, and basically, uh, just using a load balancer, um, I can uh, have applications that um, were part of it stood up in a uh, public cloud and some of it stood up in a private cloud. Um, other than that, th there's not that much interesting on this slide, except that usually when people do this in PowerPoint, they have no idea how it's actually going to work, and in generally it, it doesn't work very well. Um, so I'll talk about what we did to fix that. And um, uh, I have a high performance computing background and everything is about latency and bandwidth. And it's true here as well. And uh, I basically only pay a one to two millisecond penalty for having a private cloud compared to being in a public cloud. And that's within the noise for the kind of applications that I run. Now, how is that possible? Well, first of all, what I'm measuring is the latency from a virtual machine in my private cloud to one of the availability zones in a public cloud, and comparing that to the latency between two different availability zones in the same public cloud region. And the fact that those are uh, within a rounding error of, them, uh, of each other uh, means that I can now uh, deploy my application across a public and a private without a performance penalty because for uh, resilience I was going to have to deploy it across two availability zones anyway. And once I solve that um, infinitely hard problem, everything else is just, you know, making sure that I'm picking the right software stack so that my uh, intellectual load is, is not so heavy. Uh, you know, I, I, I make sure I'm not that smart, so I got to make sure that I pick right partners so that when I get applications running that uh, I can sensibly manage them. So uh, now I, I picked a good spot for the latency. Uh, the, also, the second good thing about being in the Virginia area is uh, bandwidth to uh, public cloud direct connects is very inexpensive. And uh, if you want advice on a really good data center in the Virginia area, see me in a break and I'll take you to their table here. That's as much of a hint as I'll give you. Um, and then as I said, uh, I also want to ensure that there's no lock-in of uh, my customers' codes. Uh, so I, 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 make sure, I really want them to build their applications so that we can deploy from private to pi private, public to pub public, all within a single public cloud and um, do the right thing for the right geography. Remember, my customers are Godzillas and, and they could decide to go into East, who knows where it is a stand, and stand up a service. I need to have the flexibility to uh, do that either with my stuff or somebody else's stuff. And uh, part of what I want to do is to uh, pick the, the, a good technology for our private cloud. Um, at this point, I think it's, I'm, I'm re certainly ready to declare OpenStack to be the winner of the stack wars for open source cloud stacks. And then uh, the most important thing we did was to pick a good hybrid partner, and of course that's RightScale. So uh, here's what that same picture looks like now with, uh, with the RightScale hybrid cloud controller, where we get to use all of the um, uh, the, the, the testing and image management and management consoles of RightScale on top of that system where we have virtual private ne networks and dedicated links between private and public, but most importantly our application writers don't have to worry about the fact that, that they're distributed that way. Uh, their application will perform appropriately uh, regardless of, of where their virtual machines or data um, reside. Okay, so uh, lessons learned, uh, you got to have a hybrid tool set to do this in a way that, that you're going to be comfortable with. And um, uh, RightScale is what we picked, of course. Uh, OpenStack is a bucket of parts. And uh, the way I think of it is it's the kernel.org of CloudStacks. And unless you want to invest a significant amount of time and sweat and money into a development group, you really should pick an integration partner and get a distribution. And the current buzzword is an opinionated distribution, 
which means they take away a lot of hard decisions that you would otherwise have to make yourselves. So pick a good friend to do that for you. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, uh, early adopters um, always have scars. Uh, we have more than our fair share uh, because we started in OpenStack so early. We have done a lot of work um, uh, of things to customize or extend OpenStack. And remember how I said we had some regrets? Well, we paved, uh, you know, the, the open source community paved over a bunch of the stuff that we did. Now we get to go back and undo um, some of those customizations that, that we needed at the time. And now the open source community has uh, provided them. And uh, just a general comment, if you looked at all of those things that, you know, a, a number of them that we buy now, uh, they're now available as open source projects. Some of them are a little early. For example, HA proxy for load balancing is quite good. Um, and uh, I think you'll see a continuous march towards using those over uh, commercial products. Great, that's it. Thank you, Thank you Richard. You good stuff. You know, at RightScale, a core tenet of our strategy is that, you know, we've seen the market evolving to a point where most customers uh, are going to have a more complex set of needs than any one cloud provider uh, can provide. So really, really exciting to see what Samson SDS is, is up to, really enabling in-tier cloud bursting to be possible uh, for as far as we've seen uh, the very first time. So thanks again, Richard, for sharing that with us. Richard will be around the show uh, until about mid-afternoon, if any of you are interested in talking further. Um, so that concludes our, our morning session, but before we break, I wanted to introduce our VP of Marketing, uh, Kim Wines, who's going to announce the winner of our Spiro contest, as well as uh, brief you on what to expect the rest of the day. So until then, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs>